Hello and welcome to the Craft Beer Corner. Uh, for today's review, we are doing another Tavor review. Uh, this is the second Tavor review uh, shipment series that we've gone through. This is the second review from this current shipment. Um, last one, if you did not catch the last video, uh, was standard IPAs. I enjoyed all of them immensely. Um, today, we're still doing IPAs, but we're kicking it up a notch. We're going into Imperial or Doubles, whichever you prefer. Um, they can be used interchangeably. Uh, today, we are going to be starting with the Bale Breaker Brewing Company's Bottom Cutter uh, Standard Imperial IPA. This is out of Yakima, Washington. Clocks in at 8.2% ABV, and it has a blend of Citra, Equinox, and Simcoe hops in it. Um, the second beer is a very, very new release. It just released at the end of April. Um, this is from Adroit Theory. Uh, this is their Evangelion. This is release number six. Gagiel Ghost 742. So it's kind of a long name, um, but nonetheless, this is a hazy Imperial IPA. They are out of Purcellville, Virginia in Loudoun County, and this is 8% ABB. The final beer uh, that we're going to be reviewing today is from the Mumford Brewing Company. This is their Montfort. They are based out of Los Angeles, California. This is a 9% Imperial New England IPA, so it's going to be hazy uh, like the Adroit Theory, and they have a blend of three hops uh, using Belma, Citra, and Simcoe. So we're seeing some interesting overlaps, so it'll be pretty interesting to see how the slight variations in hops with similarities in the bill uh, work together to make completely different beers and uh, what the grains that they used um, help to change the beer. Uh, so we've got Citra and Simcoe in both number one and number three. Now, number two was too new. I couldn't find data on what they use in there, um, but I'm sure over time we're going to get a good idea of what their hot bill is. But nonetheless, looking really forward to jumping in today's episode. I love a good uh, IPA. Um, double IPAs, Imperial IPAs, hugely popular. And we're going to dive in and see exactly why that is today, starting with the Bale Breaker Brewing Company's Bottom Cutter. All right, so jumping right in with our first beer, this is the Bale Breaker Brewing Company's Bottom Cutter Imperial IPA. Uh, again, 8.2% ABV. Um, pretty uh, subdued can. Sorry, it's sweating as it uh, sits here. But, uh, you know, it's it's nice looking. It's It's got some farm equipment on there. So Bale Breaker, Bottom Cutter, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no farmer. But uh, I do recognize that as farm equipment. Uh, perhaps that's, uh, that's a bottom cutter. I couldn't tell you. But uh, bless all those farmers. And uh, out of Yakima, it does make me wonder if uh, they are friendly with their local uh, hop suppliers. Because Yakima is straight smack in the middle of the Pacific Northwestern hop belt. Ton, a ton of world-class hops are being grown there. So God bless everybody that's... Uh, Keeping it, uh, keeping it done and making those beautiful, beautiful hops that we all love and enjoy. And in particular for the IPA and double IPA style, it takes a lot of quality fresh hops. So they're in a good spot. I imagine they get them about as fresh as they come. Nonetheless, let's go ahead and get this poured in the glass now. This looks a bit like a boring glass. Um, this is kind of an all-purpose glass. It's a little hard to tell from the camera, but it does actually flare and have a slight taper. So it goes convex to concave, and it does help the uh, aroma and the flavors trap in there and also get the nice head to stick and form. Uh, this also works pretty decently for a nice uh, cream ale or a stout that's going to have a big head. But nonetheless, let's get this poured in. Already as I'm pouring this, this is a lovely, lovely beer. This looks exactly like what I picture in my mind when I think of an IPA. This is exactly, exactly a textbook IPA. Um, looking at it, there are some particulates floating in there, so it is possible that uh, they do have some yeast sediment, um, maybe that made it into the batch, but nonetheless, uh, nice looking beer. It's not cloudy, it's clear. Um, and it's a very classic IPA color. I mean, that is textbook. 
the head formed beautifully, another textbook IPA head. Um, it's got a nice creamy head on top, but there's some medium sized bubbles coming up from the bottom. So it's slowly starting to collapse, much like I'd expect. Um, let's give it a sniff. That's got a very, very pronounced aroma indeed. Very pronounced. Um, you can smell the hops in there. They are very, very forward on the nose. A big, big, big aroma. Um, you can hands down smell each of them independently. They all have a slightly different aroma profile and they are not lost in this beer. And it's a big hop forward nose. Mmm, that smells great. I just want to jump right in there. The head has settled down, so let's do exactly that. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, that's beautifully hop forward. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. This is a really, really, really good example of a double IPA. All right. In general, I steer clear of doubles because often once you start pumping extra malts, you've heard me talk about this if you've seen a lot of my previous episodes, once you start raising the grain volume in the grain bill, oftentimes it starts to overshadow the bittering effect of the hop and it starts to take on these caramelly notes and kind of buttery and buttered popcorn notes and different diacetyls that flavor that come through during the brewing process, but it kind of overshadows the hop. It doesn't let that nice astringent bitter edge come through. This, they chose nice, big, bold, high alpha acid hops, and it is so well balanced and it's still in your face. This is a very strongly bitter IPA. This is easily one of the best double imperial IPAs I've ever had. I don't normally go for them because I'm typically disappointed. This one, I am absolutely thrilled with how this tastes. Imperial, yeah, the ABV's up, but it still tastes like what I think an IPA should. The hop is the star, the bitter is the forward profile, and this is big and in your face bitter. That is so good. The body is really nice, medium heavy, and the mouthfeel is just absolutely silky smooth. Mm hmm A ridiculously smooth mouthfeel. Big, big body, a lot of weight to it. There is a good bit of viscosity to the mouthfeel as well. Aside from it being creamy, it really sticks around the mouth and this flavor just lingers. It is so long. The finish is ridiculously long. And really, this beer is all about showcasing amazing hops. The grains are very, very secondary, maybe 10% of the overall flavor profile. It is big, bold, in-your-face hops and bitters. You get a mix of floral and citrus, and the predominant uh, hop flavor profile that comes through is a nice, earthy, really, really earthy, big, bold, earthy hop flavor, and just the slightest suggestion of pine on the back. I don't even wanna say it's, 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 it's present, it's just a whisper, just, just a hint of pine, but it's predominantly um, front floral citrus, then 85% earthy, and it's big bitter. This is a fantastic double IPA. This is exactly what I want when I think of a double IPA. Bravo, Bale Breaker. This is excellent, excellent beer. I'm gonna take my time enjoying this because I don't often enjoy a double this much. So I'm gonna come up with my scores and when we come back, we will jump on to the Adroit Theories, Evangelion 6, Gagil, Ghost 742, Hazy Imperial IPA at 8% ABV. All right, so for our second beer, we're jumping on to the Adroit Theories, uh, kind of a mouthful here, Evangelion 6, Gagil, Ghost 742. This is a Hazy Imperial IPA. Again, they're out of Percival, Virginia. This is 8%. Um, first thing first, let's just start with the bottle art. Um, it's got some very, very cool bottle art. I'm going to get that as close to my camera lens as possible. Hopefully it's picking that up. It uh, looks really, really nice. Uh, interestingly, on the back, 
I've never seen this from a brewer, but this is a great idea. Uh, I wholly approve. They give you suggestions of various and sundry uh, things with which to pair this beer. Uh, for food, they suggest grilled flat iron steaks with tomatoes and tapenade. Cheese, they suggest Blu del Bon Viso. And then they also suggest cigars. Padron Family Reserve, number 44, natural. So a lot of different interesting things that they suggest would go well and complement this beer. I'm a fan of that. I think there should be more of that. That's awesome. Um, I'm a big fan of pairing excellent quality beer with excellent food and other like items. Um, you know, craft beer goes with a lot of things. It makes a lot of things better and accentuates it and they play off one another and just make the whole experience better. How could it not be? It's got craft beer in it, but nonetheless, let's jump right in. Nice big bottle. I will not get this whole thing in the glass. Let's go ahead and uh, get this poured. Oh, this is probably the lightest colored Imperial I've ever seen in my life. Um, I did not expect that at all by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, that is really quite a beautiful beer. It's got a little haze to it. I don't see but the tiniest fine little little bit of effervescence coming up. It's very tiny tight bubbles just from a couple little beads on the bottom of the glass. And the head formed pretty well. Uh, it's not the tightest bubbles. It's rather loose but it still looks nice. Classic IPA. This is not a classic Imperial IPA color, but it looks nice. I'd say it's a lot more akin to say a Hellas Lager or even a Goza color. Um, you know, this is not your prototypical double IPA, but it's still a nice looking uh, double IPA rather. Still looks nice. Let's give it a sniff. Okay. Want to take one more sniff just to make sure my nose isn't playing tricks on me. Okay, yeah. Um, the aroma is very, very citrus forward. Uh, it smells strongly of grapefruit and it smells strongly of a mix of lemon and limes, um, kind of secondary to the grapefruit. Just a hint of a floral uh, kind of back. I didn't get any earthy, any pine or resin. Mm, maybe actually just a subtle hint of earthy and it's on the back end of the grapefruit, almost how a grapefruit rind has that completely different experience from the actual flesh of the fruit itself. And you could say that that really bitter kind of sour that comes from citrus imparts kind of this earthy undertone. That's what I'm getting in the aroma here. It smells really nice. Let's go ahead and jump in. That head settled. It's got a little cling, but it's mostly collapsed. Let's, let's give it a sip. Okay, that's a nice beer. It's a nice beer. Um, if you're a fan of the hazy New England IPA style and the juice bombs, as people will term them, you'll probably love this. For me, it's, it's, it's overplayed. It's not what I'm looking for in an IPA by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think it's a fad and I think it's gonna phase out. And um, I know many people may uh, disagree vehemently with, with me on this, but uh, I'm a, I'm, as much as I like experimentation when it comes to IPAs, um, I'm a bit of a purist in that regard. And you can experiment all you want, but I don't want to taste juice in my IPA. I want a boot full of hops and I want to taste the bitters. I want it as bitter as the deepest French roasted black coffee. Bitter, astringently bitter. Think wormwood. Um, that's what I want. I don't want to taste big bursting mouthfuls of juicy fruity. That's, that's nonsense. I'm, I'm not interested in it. But if you are a fan of that, you'll absolutely really enjoy this beer. And it does have a bit of bitters. Um, you know, I don't normally expect it to be that present in a double IPA. Seeing one with clearly less deeply roasted malts kind of got me hopeful that perhaps it would be a bit more bitter forward. And the bitters are there and you can get them. But the overriding characteristic trait of this is it's very juicy. It's very fruity and it's very citrusy. Um, so if you like the style, you'll probably really enjoy this beer. Um, if you're a hop head purist as I am, um, you probably won't enjoy this as much, but it's a good beer, don't get me wrong. I am only telling you my subjective thoughts. I am going to rank this appropriately for the style, and I suspect it's gonna rank quite high um, because this is a well done example of the New England IPA uh, sub style. 
Mm -hmm. It's got a nice body to it. It's actually pretty heavy. It's not stout heavy, like Prairie Artisan heavy, but it's it's got some heft. It's cleanly medium heavy. Um, I would almost say it borderlines heavy, which as an 8% Imperial kind of surprises me. Um, the mouthfeel, as you might expect from a New England style, hazy, whatever you wish to call it, um, that that tomfoolery, <laughs> um, it's, it's got a very robust mouthfeel and it is ridiculously creamy. Um, this whole adjectives that they tack on to this new subgenre style, juicy juice bomb, milkshake, all that, it's describing various aspects of what these beers are like. And the milkshake is one you hear a lot. And it's, I would suspect, a reference to the mouthfeel of the beer. It does feel just ridiculously creamy like a thick milkshake does in the mouth. It's got viscosity. And uh, this has weight to it, which adds to that effect. But it is just ridiculously creamy, much like a cream ale. Um, you could call that the original milkshake, What uh, you know... Uh, it's, it's a fad. It, it'll disappear, these ridiculous adjectives. But nonetheless, that's what this is. Um, it's a nice, nice, very nice example of this style, especially as a double. And it's got some bitters. They, they are present. They're not as forward and pungent and astringent as I like in any iteration of an IPA, be it single, double, triple, imperial, whatever you want to call it, whatever, it doesn't matter. But they're still there. It, it's not gone. It's not just like I'm drinking pure fruit juice, which I'm having a beer and I paid good money for it. If I wanted a glass of fruit juice, I could save 10 bucks and just go buy a freaking carton of fruit juice and enjoy a glass of fruit juice. But yes, I want to know I'm drinking beer when I'm drinking beer. And this, um, you can definitely still tell you're drinking beer, uh, which is nice. Yeah, there's some nice bitters up front. It lingers for a couple seconds and it's just pure fruit. It's all citrus. It's grapefruit, lemon lime, orange in the back. Maybe just a hint of a pineapple flavor in the back as well. It's very nice. It's a very, very flavorful beer. This is well, well done. This is well executed. Um, I would say overall for the style, it's very, very well balanced. Um, the finish isn't as long as I expected, nor as long as I typically like in my IPAs, but this is a good beer. Um, I'm gonna take my time and really scrutinize this while I enjoy, um, gosh, there's still so much left in this bottle, uh, while, I, while I get to enjoy what remains here. And um, we'll come back and next up is the Mumford Brewing Montfort out of Los Angeles, California. That's a 9% New England style featuring uh, Belma, Citra, and Simcoe hops. So it's gonna be another one similar to this and I'm very interested to see how this New England compares to this Hazy and the hot bill in the last one compares to the hot bill in the first. So we'll see you back and I will come up with the scores and we'll jump onto the Mumford Brewing Montfort. Okay, moving on to our third and final beer of today's Imperial IPA review. We move on to the Mumford Brewing Montfort. They are out of Los Angeles, California. This is 9% ABV. And this is um, one I'm really interested to see how it compares to the Bale Breaker. Uh, this has two of the same uh, hops in it and it also has a third. So Belma is the outlier and then Citra and Simcoe, which the Bale Breaker also uh, featured. So kind of um, a nice uh, pastel green color label here. It's got pretty interesting artwork on the can. Uh, I'm not sure if the camera can pick that up, but pretty neat looking can. Let's go ahead and get this cracked and uh, jump right in. See what this is about. All right. All right, this is very effervescent. So I am going to try to be gentle here because I don't want the head to get overblown. So I'm already not the best beer pourer in the world as it were. And this seems to be quite effervescent and it really wants to let that head form. So I don't want it to get out of control. All right, 
not quite the full can in there, but uh, exactly as advertised, this is indeed a ridiculously hazy, a classic Telltale New England IPA style. This is so occluded. I mean, honestly, the light is kind of filtering around it. It's not getting through. This is really, really, really cloudy, really hazy indeed. Um, the head did form quite beautifully. That's got a really nice, tight, creamy, foamy head on top. Uh, looks like it just came off of a draft. So, you know, from a can in a bottle, you never know. This one poured quite well. Uh, looks very, very good. Let's give it a sniff. Yeah, that smells ridiculously fruity and also hoppy. You can smell a nice balance of this kind of fruity, fruity back and the hops are really shining on the nose. Um, it, it smells, the aroma is very much in equal balance. You get a nice mix of fruit and you get a nice, nice mix of hops. And certainly uh, some of that fruity character is, is coming from the hops as it should in uh, a New England IPA. So it smells very nice. It's got a really pronounced aroma. Th those hops smell very big and very fresh and the fruity back nature of them just really pairs well. So I expect this is gonna be kind of a quintessential New England IPA style. Um, I'm gonna approach this with an open mind, think very hard on uh, the style itself. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. That head settled down just enough, it looks uh, pretty much good to go. Mm. Okay, okay, that's a good New England IPA. It really is. Um, the hops really do, do come through. Uh, it is hop dominant. Uh, true to the classic New England IPA style that's all the rage right now, there is this big burst of fruitiness and what some might call juicy. Um, really, I think that descriptor comes from the combination of a couple different factors. One is the hops that are used that are very fruit forward, fruit forward in the first place, and two, the ridiculously creamy, silky texture of the mouthfeel that adds that viscosity that lets all of those flavors kind of linger around. So it adds the impression of, of juice just bursting forth. And I can easily see why many, many people would really, really like this style. It's, it's not bad, it's nice. Um, you know my thoughts and my opinions on it. This is a good beer and it is a good example of this style. It's not personally for me in the world of IPAs, but I figure I have to do justice. I have to drink some, let you know what I actually think about it without my own personal judgment and reservations getting into the mix. So I'm gonna give my unadulterated thoughts on this as an example of this style. It's excellent. This is an excellent, excellent beer. I'm gonna have another sip here so I can try to get a sense of how long the finish is and how it plays out. Very juicy, very fruity up front. Then that opens immediately into the hops and the juice starts to take a back seat, that fruit character. The fruit that I'm getting is largely maybe a combination of orange and pineapple. And then the hops that it opens into, very, very earthy and um, uh, a little bit of pine. There's a little bit of pine. Um, it's got Simcoe and Citra in it. Both of those, depending on the balance, can impart some of that flavor characteristic. Uh, Simcoe tends to be a little more heavy on that end than the Citra. But again, it all comes down to the balance of the hops. Now, Belma is not a hop variety uh, with which I am familiar. I am definitely gonna be doing some research on it. Um, it's, it's clearly different than the Bale Breaker. Uh, different styles, there's this a standard Imperial IPA. This is a New England style. Though this has Belma, that had Equinox, and while they are both very, very hop forward, Citra and Simcoe are big, high alpha acid, very, very big, bold hops indeed. But the Equinox and the Belma and the Belma difference do make a completely different beer experience here. Um, but still, it's very hop forward. The finish is reasonably long. I'd say it's kind of a medium length, all totaled start to finish. 
for the majority of the flavor profile, it's probably about 10 seconds. The juice and fruit lasts up front, maybe the first two to three, then it opens up fully into hops. Um, there's not really that much of a malt presence, so to speak. It's in there, it's the backbone of the beer, but it doesn't leap forward. It's really letting the hop and the hop characteristics shine through as it should in an IPA. Um, the body, it's, it's a little lighter than I thought it would be, especially for a 9% IPA. It's medium. I, I expected it to be a little heavier, but it's medium. The mouthfeel is perfect for this style. Honestly, it is. That's how they should be. Really creamy, really silky, with really fine bubbles to give that really creamy, milkshake-like mouthfeel and quality. And that's what lets all of these flavors continue to interplay. It's very nice. It's very well done. Overall, I would say this is a very, very exceptionally well-balanced beer, particularly considering the style that it is. Um, oftentimes, that fruity, juicy quality that everybody's shooting for overshines the hop. Here, they were not shy about using the hops and they picked big ones. So even though it is that juicy, fruity, bursty, classic New England IPA uh, traits, the hops come through in abundance and I absolutely love it. And I realize maybe people going for New England IPAs, that's not their thing. Maybe they're picking them because they're less hop forward, less hop intense, less bitter intense. But for me, it's still, regardless of the subgenre, it's an IPA at heart. And the hop is the star of the show in an IPA. It just is. That's how the style was born. It was born from hops and heavy handedness with hops. And hops, they impart a lot of characteristics, but bittering is one of them. And you could make a very sound and valid argument that it's arguably the most important characteristic trait that it brings to the table. Overall, this is an excellent, excellent example of a New England IPA. I'm a big fan and um, I will take my time coming up with my scores and uh, we'll come back and we'll go through all three from top to bottom. All right, now that we have gotten to taste and sample all three of these beers, uh, we're gonna go through as per the usual standard practice, uh, top to bottom. Um, get the rankings. Um, as always, 100 point scale, 10 points possible in 10 categories. Uh, we're going to start with the Bale Breaker Brewing Company's Bottom Cutter. Uh, again, these are all Imperial IPAs. This one is out of Yakima, Washington, 8.2% ABV and had a blend of Citra, Equinox, and Simcoe hops in it. Uh, starting with the aroma, this was very nice. You could tell that it was going to be very hoppy up front and you could pick out the different aromas that each of those specific hop varieties brought to the table and it was rather pronounced. Uh, well above average, eight out of 10. Um, the taste, this knocked it out of the ballpark for me. I really didn't expect it to be that hop forward because Imperials tend to lose some of that hop edge once they start adding extra fermentables to boost up the AVV. Um, it starts to typically take on a more malty character um, often kind of caramel, buttered popcorn, those kind of flavors override the hop trait and kind of drown out the bitters. But this was very much an exception. It was ridiculously hop forward and very pungently bitter. Exactly what I wish I always found in an Imperial, 10 out of 10. Uh, the body on this was huge. Um, a lot of fermentables um, doesn't necessarily mean a bigger body, but it usually does. But this was even bigger than I anticipated at 8.2. That's a good high ABV, but it's still um, a bit lower than what the body produced. I gave the body a 9 out of 10. Uh, the mouthfeel on this was perfect. Perfect Imperial IPA, 10 out of 10. The finish on this was super long. It was so long, I was having a hard time believing that it was still going. And it was hop, and it was hop, and it was hop, and it was bitter and bitter and bitter. It just lasted so long. Perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, the head of the retention on this was also textbook. I often talk about this, you know, pouring from a can or a bottle versus getting it on draft. There's a lot of X factors. Cleanliness of the glassware, how well you actually pour it, the speed of the pour, the angle, the whole nine yards, it's actually an art. But this looked as good as any head you'd get off a tap, 10 out of 10. Um, the appearance, this was textbook Imperial IPA. Couldn't have asked for more, perfect 10 out of 10. The balance on this. 
The balance on this was very nice. It was above average. Um, really, the only thing that I could possibly critique on the balance on this one was I would have liked a little more hop forward quality from each of the specific hops. They were in there and it came out in the aroma and a bit in the flavor, but it wasn't an even distribution. It was well balanced in terms of an IPA and certainly I appreciate the hop forward nature of it, but I would have liked to see each of the individual hops play their specific parts a little more evenly across the flavor and aroma distribution. Uh, still well above average, seven out of 10. Filling in the intangible, I loved it. I don't normally go for Imperial IPAs for all the reasons I've said before, but this one is a home run, perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, finally, as an example of the style, same as my feeling in Intangible. I, I could not think of a more perfect example of an Imperial IPA. For my money, this is what they should be. Don't let the added malts to boost up that ABV drown out your hops. Get enough of them in there. Get enough of them in there. Choose hops that have high alpha acids to let those bitters still shine through and not take a back seat to the malt. And this nailed it. Perfect 10 out of 10. That brings the total score on the Bale Breaker Brewing Company's bottom cutter to a 94 out of 100. That is a very, very high score and well earned. Um, moving on to number two, this is Adroit Theories. Long name, Evangelion 6 Gagiel Ghost 742. Um, this is a hazy Imperial IPA. They are out of Purcellville, Virginia, and this is 8% ABV. This is the lowest ABV of the bunch, but only by 0.2%. In fact, there's only a 1% spread between the lowest and highest. Um, nonetheless, jumping right in the aroma, the aroma was nice. You could pick up the hops, you could pick up the malt bill, but it wasn't super forward. Even when I jostled it around and took a really deep sniff, the nose just wasn't that pronounced. It was above average for sure, but it wasn't on the upper echelon, so I gave it a seven out of 10. Uh, moving on to the taste. The taste was nice. It was a very enjoyable flavor. Um, I really appreciated it, and you could tell that it was an IPA, but I would have liked a little more hop forward flavor profile, and that just didn't happen for me. It was still well above average, but it wasn't on the same level as say the bottom cutter. Uh, still a respectable score, eight out of 10 for the taste. Uh, moving on to the body. The body was very, very nice. It was very big. You could really feel the weight of it in your mouth, um, which I expect from an Imperial and it didn't disappoint. I gave it just one point shy of perfection, nine out of 10. The mouthfeel on this was textbook Imperial IPA. And the hazy ones tend to add a bit more of a creamy nature to them. And that's not that uncommon for an IPA, but, but this checked all the boxes for me. It was a 10 out of 10 for the mouthfeel. Uh, moving on to the finish. The finish was actually one of the categories that disappointed me a little bit. Um, it wasn't bad, it wasn't great. Uh, I thought it was squarely in the average range on the high end, um, it just didn't last long enough. And this beer had a lot going for it, but the finish kind of let it down. I didn't get to experiencing experience it as long as I would like after the sip. It, it just dissipated too quickly um, for my liking, but still above average, six out of 10. Uh, the head and the retention on this one, I gave the exact same score as the finish. And you saw when I poured it, it didn't bloom that great of a head. And then when it did finally create, it collapsed so quickly, there was just no substance left to it, um, really comparative to the others. Um, Coming from a bottle, you know, it is what it is, but I still would have expected it to last a little longer. It wasn't bad, but it was just in the average range, another six out of 10. Uh, moving on to the appearance, this was a nice looking beer, um, and it was a hazy, and it had a bit of a haze to it. Uh, there was no question that it was a cloudier, occluded appearance to it, um, but it was very, very light colored for an Imperial, and obviously, you know, the color, there's a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, the dominant factor is the level of roasting on the malts in the malt bill and where they fall on the love -a bond scale. If, if you're not a brewer and you don't know what that is, that is a scale that ranks from zero to several thousand varying degrees of intensity on color shades. So the very lightest, say white would be no color, pitch black would be all color. 
um, it would be zero on the white end and you know several thousand on the end of the black end. I think in theory it could technically go on forever, but um, this was very, very light. And that's not prototypical of the style. It still was a nice looking beer, so I didn't want to dock that many points, but it wasn't classic for the style. So I settled on a seven and I think that's a fair number. Um, the balance on this was nice. It was above average. Uh, this was another category where I wished that the hops had been a little more forward that I could have gotten more bitters out of them and really get more of the flavors rolling around. There was a lot of nice qualities from the malt, no question about it, and it was quality. But in an IPA, I just want the hops to be more front and center and they weren't quite to the exceptional level for me, but still well above average, I give it a seven out of 10. Um, feeling in the intangible, I also enjoyed this beer. Um, I don't normally go for Imperials, and, and I've said it many times, but this one was still nice. It was above average. I gave it a seven out of 10 for my personal feelings. Uh, finally, as an example of the style, I, I had to really think critically on this, but for what it is and what it did, I still think it was well above average. Not top, top, top tier, but certainly well, well above average and worth seeking out and worth trying just to see if it's for you. Eight out of 10 for the example of the style that brings the total score on Adroit Theories Evangelion 6 Gagiel Ghost 742 to a total score of 75 out of 100. So still well above average beer. Um, I, I would recommend it to anybody that just wants to try something different or if you're a fan of Hazy Imperials, you might really enjoy this one. Uh, this is a very well, re well received brewer. Um, so I'd, I'd be very keen to try some more of their offerings in the future. Uh, moving on to the final beer of today, uh, that's the Mumford Brewings Montfort out of Los Angeles, California. This one's 9%. This is a classic Imperial New England style IPA. Uh, this one was the one that had two of the same three hops uh, as the bottom cutter, both having Citra and Simcoe, but the third hop in this one was Belma. That's not a hop variety with which I'm familiar and I want to get up to speed on what the characteristics and character traits are so I can really dig in. And I wanna seek out more beers that um, feature Belma hops because I'm all about trying new hops and seeing how they're used and seeing what new interesting beers you can come up with just by changing hops and hop bills. It's always interesting to try. But uh, we're gonna jump right in. The aroma. This was a massive aroma. It was so big and in your face, and I, I don't remember the last time I had a New England IPA that had that pronounced of aroma. I gave it a perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, the taste on this, absolutely fantastic. Again, I have to think about the style. I am not rating outside of my feeling and intangible, and even there, I'm taking into consideration the style. But everything else, this is not subjective. This is based on the style of the beer. While I may not personally go for New England IPAs or Imperials, as an example of the style, the taste, nine out of 10. It was just shy of perfection. Uh, the body on this was very, very big. 9% ABV, you kind of expected it to be. And I was a little surprised because granted, it's only a 1% ABV difference between the lot. This was the highest, but I did think it had a slightly less heavy and present and bold body than the other two. I gave it one point lower than the prior two beers. I gave it an eight, but still well above average. Um, the mouthfeel on this was textbook, picture perfect, New England IPA, Imperial. It was a 10 out of 10. Uh, the finish on this was so long. It was so long, I was so happy with it. And I was even happier because while it was juicy and fruity and bursty and that mouthfeel made it rather milkshakey, the hop did not take a back seat to that classic New England character traits. It was a hop forward New England, which I loved. And I gave it a, a, a nice uh, nine out of 10 on the finish. It, it just kept going and going and, uh, and the juice and the fruit, they played their part, but the hops just kept coming at me over time and they just kept coming at me and I really enjoyed it. And I could pick out all the different hops and it was so lovely. Um, the head and the retention on this one, this one was just like the first one. It poured perfectly from the can. Perfect 10 out of 10. Textbook. Appearance. If there is a more textbook appearance to a New England, I don't know what it is. That's a 10 out of 10. Balance on this. 
this was an absolutely well-balanced beer. You got the classic traits of a New England style and you got the classic traits of a hop, which should be in any IPA, including Imperials. And this did it very, very well indeed. I give that a nine out of 10. Feeling in the intangible, this is my subjective category, but again, it's subjective based on the style. I gave it a nine out of 10. I thought it was about as near to perfect for me personally as a New England's gonna get. I loved it. Finally, as an example of the style, it mirrors my feeling in intangibles. I give it a nine out of 10. I mean, this is just about as close to perfection as, as I could think of off the top of my head. I would love to taste one where I get some tens on the categories, just have that benchmark. I've yet to discover it, but I'm holding out hopeful. So uh, leave the comments, uh, please. If you have some you think I should try to make me a convert, let me know about them. I am very, very keen. I've been hating on this style for a while just on a personal level, but if you know some that based on what I talk about, you think, hey, I think that's the one, that's the one that would do it for you, let me know, I would love to try it. Um, that brings the total score on the Mumford Brewing's Mumford to a 93 out of 100. So these two, just one point apart with the adroit theory, um, the lowest uh, by a pretty good margin, but still 75 is well above average. These two beers just happen to be exceptional beers. And I mean that, exceptional beers for what they are. All three of these were fantastic. I really, really enjoyed this Imperial IPA review and all quite a bit different from one another. So, I mean, it just really solidifies again why I love craft beer so much. The offerings out there in the marketplace are so inventive and they're all different. They all bring something completely unique to the table and just try as many as you can. You never know what the next beer journey is gonna bring and it, it's totally worth it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as always, I thank you so much for tuning in. Um, as we're growing our channel, it really does help. If maybe this is the first video you've caught, please consider liking and subscribing. We're bringing a ton of content, multiple videos a week. Uh, to start, we're, we're churning out reviews, and then when I get the time and get completely ahead of the game, I'm gonna start some other side projects here that I think are gonna be of interest, including uh, beer and food pairings. We're gonna be doing uh, home brewing recipes and uh, tutorials. We're gonna do home brewing equipment reviews. Um, we're gonna do a segment that I'm gonna call Beer School for all the fellow beer nerds. Maybe you know and you like craft beer, but you don't really know all of the science behind of it and you're interested in that kind of stuff. I'm gonna break it down in my Beer School side project series. That's gonna be a lot of fun. So there's much more content to come. If you wanna know when our videos drop, please do click that notification bell. It will let you know right when our videos go live. And as always, thank you so much for joining. Until next time, keep it beer, keep it craft. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers.